How's it going everybody? This podcast is brought to you by Rise Make Life Workout, a health, self-development and lifestyle platform building a passionate community of knowledge seekers, creative dreamers and future leaders. For details on the latest Rise event that will feature expert speakers in the field of self-development and growth, check out www.rise-workout.com. That's www.rise-workout.com. Enjoy the show. And welcome back to another episode of Rise Optimize, where we make science simple to help you optimize your health. My name's Sinead, and I'm joined by Dr. Shah today. Hi, Sinead. Today we are talking about a couple of supplements in particular and whether they are worth your money. Yes. I'm looking forward to this. (laughs) Yeah, these are quite popular supplements. So we're going to be talking about BCAAs or branched chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most people would have seen them in the gym. They're kind of powder that people add to their drinks. And also collagen supplements, which are always all of Instagram. You yes, know, pro- you probably know someone who is sponsored by <laughs> not, <you> know, us. <laughs> not, yeah, not <laughs> us, but yeah, they're, they're rife across Instagram and it, it does make you wonder like, oh man, am I missing out by not mm. taking, taking those? Because I want glowing skin and strong nails and beautiful hair. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll go into talking about those and yeah. what they can and can't offer perhaps yeah and that's the thing with supplements it's they aren't always cheap so i think people do need to know if it is actually having an effect or it's doing what it claims to do if you're going to be spending that kind of money on something because mm. there'll be nothing worse than thinking it's doing xyz and then finding out well it might be doing that but not as much as you think it's doing or it might not have any effect at all so. yeah and potentially alternatives that that might be uh, potentially the same or superior stand-ins for that same product which I, yeah. I hope to talk about particularly with collagen yeah cool yay all right well let's get into it we'll start <clears throat> with Brant's chain amino acids so what are they for people that might not have heard of them. Yeah, so branched chain amino acids, uh, they're three uh, of the essential amino acids. So those are the ones that we can't produce in the body. So we get them from our diet. If you go back to our protein episode, I talk more about protein generally and amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So they're the smaller little subcomponents that make up all the proteins in our body as well. And they're also used for fuel. They're sometimes used as precursors for neurotransmitters, a bunch of stuff. So they're a very important component generally of, well, protein is an important component of our diets the amino acids that make them up are also important for our bodies so that we can make protein as well Mm. Uh, so the branched chain amino acids there are three of them leucine isoleucine and valine and in a branched chain amino acid supplement there's a specific ratio that those are normally in and it's normally 211 so you have uh, twice as much leucine as you do isoleucine and valine and there are a couple of different reasons why people use them so some are and one that I'm very familiar with is that it helps to prevent fatigue and prolonged exercise mm-hmm. that's one claim another is to help recovery and sort of recover faster from muscle damage after exercise and then the third is to promote uh, muscle growth Mm -hmm. after exercise yeah Yeah. i've heard all of those before yeah i've been told all of those before when i was once on brant's chain amino acids oh how long did you use them for oh probably like three months or so what did you Um, think i think at the time i probably thought it was helping Mm. to some degree but then there was definitely i think after a few weeks it was like I didn't feel a huge difference in regards to I think I, I was particularly told that it would help like during exercise like reducing right. that muscle damage and allow you to keep pushing through a workout and over time yeah I didn't feel a huge difference so then I was like I'm gonna not spend $80 on this yeah they are very expensive aren't yeah. they I was quite <laughs> shocked actually at how expensive mm. they were so I initially learned about BCAAs when I was getting my thesis together in my Mm. PhD because so BCAAs are actually because of that proposed benefit of being able to attenuate fatigue the mechanism by which they're thought to do that initially was proposed to be involved with central fatigue or the brain Mm -hmm. and so that was that was a core topic in my thesis and so I had to look at this particular nutrient or supplement as 
a possible intervention as to how central fatigue might develop. Mm. Um, and there's actually a really elegant hy- hypothesis that it, it's beautiful in the way that it sort of speaks about the chain of events that can happen and you can see where BCAs could fit in quite nicely. But mm. And it seems to hold in animals, but in humans the case gets more complicated. So mm. yeah, I, I came at it from the combating fatigue during prolonged ac- exercise part mm-hmm. more so. I've also heard people say that it's been marketed to them as something that just helps them or can help with rehydrating in terms of the taste of, if they don't like the taste of water, that BCAs Mm. could help with that Mm. because they're tasty. They are. Yeah, I think after (laughs) a while I was like, this tastes nice. But then after a while I was like, is this actually helping me? I felt that, again, what dictated if I had energy, sustained energy for a workout was more if I slept well, you Mm. know, throughout that week and was eating well and, and hydrated and all those kind of other things felt that that had more of an influence on my workout. But anyway. Mm. We can get into, I guess, some of the reasons why those claims have come through. Yeah, so one, I mean, BCAs, I can really see why people look to these. And and when when the mechanism or proposed mechanism is explained, it is quite convincing. Mm. If With a surface level knowledge of, of physiology, you would be like, oh, okay, you know. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And so one of them is, let's talk about the muscle damage and the muscle growth part of that claim. So BCAs, one of those amino acids in them is leucine. Leucine is quite important for signaling the muscle protein synthesis pathway. And so that is where it was thought that it it might help with things like recovery after exercise and reducing muscle damage, reducing muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. And in studies, there is a perceived effect of it in that sense, but in terms of actual markers of muscle damage, it, d- it doesn't differ between BCAs and placebo. Another point here to think about is potentially you could get the same effect from having a protein supplement, mm. which has a full amino acid profile mm. as well, or one that has potentially more leucine in it as well, rather than restricting it to just the three amino acids. A whey protein supplement, for example, is a lot cheaper than Mm -hmm. BCAAs. So if you are concerned about muscle growth and repair Mm -hmm. after exercise, then some of the benefit that some of these studies have seen might just simply be because it's providing protein. Protein. And if if you then compare it to a protein supplement, yeah, they're about the same, yeah. <laughs> if not better with the protein supplement. So yeah. there's that sort of side to it. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about whether or not these are worth investing in, mm. I think. The other part of that is some of those benefits aren't necessarily conferred acutely. They would happen because you're taking BCAAs over a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. So there was a study that looked at muscle soreness and you know their exercise that they did to induce muscle soreness was things like jumping off boxes. So you're doing that mm-hmm. eccentric ex- exercise to induce more muscle damage. You had to have been supplementing with BCAAs for at least two weeks prior to that to see any benefit in perceived muscle soreness Mm -hmm. or any change in the markers. So it's often advertised as having an acute effect, but there could also be this effect that's happening when you're taking them over time. Yeah, regularly for a period of time. Mm. And what about in regards to um, reducing muscle damage or helping with recovery during a workout? It doesn't seem to confirm. There is small evidence for it, but Mm. the results are all over the place. Yeah. That in some, you sort of would come to it, and for for me anyway, assessing that, I would would come to the conclusion that it's probably not worth Mm. the money. Yeah, there's not like a clear consensus across the research. Yeah, to use it. And I mean, just to to hit home that point, even the Australian Institute of Sport, this is classed as a group C supplement. So Mm -hmm. that sort of means while there might have been some promising evidence in support of it, there isn't a consensus and it Mm -hmm. doesn't seem it would be a supplement that you would put time and energy into Mm -hmm. when you could potentially achieve the same kind of benefits by something like protein supplementation, Mm. for example. Yeah. And then the idea of combating fatigue, 
during prolonged exercise. What does the science have to say about that? Yeah, so the proposed mechanism for that, there's two kind of things. So one is that it would provide, so as you're having your BCAs, it will provide some extra protein and or amino acids in prolonged exercise for the muscle to use as it runs out of glycogen. Mm -hmm. That would have to be a really long period of time. There isn't much evidence that it provides that benefit anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the other side of that, so that would be a, a peripheral mechanism of fatigue, so something that's occurring within the muscle. There isn't much evidence in support of that. Then there is the side of it where it could potentially combat fatigue in the brain. And this centers around this hypothesis called the central fatigue hypothesis. And that relates to the idea that serotonin is an important contributor to the development of brain-based fatigue during exercise. So let me just say this is a hypothesis, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so what I'm going to describe is not fact. This is yeah. this is the way that this is what was hypothesized. So during exercise we have or prolonged exercise we have lipolysis and use of substrate that frees up a bunch of free fatty acids that are now circulating in the blood. One of the things that happens when free fatty acids are circulating is they, they tend to try to find uh, albumin, which is a, a protein mm -hmm. in the blood. Oftentimes on albumin there is a another amino acid, an, an essential amino acid called tryptophan that is sitting on it. The free fatty acids knock the tryptophan off and take their binding spot. And so you have more of this free circulating tryptophan happening in the blood. Now tryptophan is important in the brain because it's a precursor to serotonin. So mm -hmm. the idea was that by having more free circulating tryptophan, it then can cross the blood brain barrier into the brain and you'll have higher rates of production of serotonin, which then result in more serotonin, more fatigue, mm -hmm. very simply put, because the serotonergic system is involved in attention, sleep and arousal. Uh, the projections are really wide, so it's quite mm -hmm. difficult to kind of tease apart all of the effects of the serotonergic system, but those are sort of some of them. Yeah. So the, where BCAAs come into this is potentially as a nutritional manipulation where you could stop the rate of tryptophan moving across into the brain. The rate of serotonin production isn't limited by how much of the enzyme is in the brain. It's limited by how fast you can get tryptophan across there. Tryptophan is quite a big amino acid, much like what BCAAs are, mm -hmm. and they use the same transporter to get across into the brain. Mm -hmm. And so if you take the BCAA supplement while you're exercising, the idea was that you'll have more of those circulating across and you'll basically slow the rate of tryptophan transfer across to the brain and thereby potentially affect the rate of serotonin production because you've got the BCAAs there mm -hmm. clogging up the system. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, I get that. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the proposed mechanism by how BCAAs might have attenuated central fatigue during mm -hmm. prolonged exercise. And that central fatigue hypothesis holds really well in animal models, but didn't seem to transfer over very well to human models. And same with the with the use of BCAAs. It did seem like in animals, BCAAs w was a successful, useful way of preventing fatigue from occurring. But when we come into human models, the research is all over the place. Like mm. a lot of studies show no effect in things like time to exhaustion. You'll still see things like people might rate their perceived exertion as lower with the BCAAs, but the actual outcome measure doesn't appear to be different. Mm -hmm. A good example that we're not always like rats and things, <laughs> yeah. you know, what works yeah. for them or, or, is, you yeah, know, or horses. Work. They yeah. had a couple of studies in horses as well. And what the neuroscientist in me takes from that is that, you know, the serotonergic system probably does play a role in central fatigue, but it maybe is not as much of a player as some of the other neurotransmitter systems. In the end, I did a lot of work with dopamine and norepinephrine, and mm -hmm. that's where all of my caffeine knowledge comes from yeah. because of that. Yeah, you could you could say either the increase in serotonin doesn't contribute to central fatigue or it does somehow, but it's not functionally significant in, that, mm -hmm. in, in the measures that we can see. And mm -hmm. so bringing us back to whether or not to use BCAAs, after looking at all of that literature for me, and at the time being an endurance athlete, I was like, ah, nah. 
Mm. <laughs> it just yeah. wasn't convincing enough. Like you said, when there's not a, a clear consensus across all the research to say, yes, this you know, 10 times out of 12, it works, it's mm. good. Then when you plus the cost of it, that's where it's hard to sort of justify things. Different if it was, again, if we were sponsored and we we're getting <laughs> CAAs for free, <laughs> then maybe we would take them because it doesn't cost us anything and there's no, I guess, side effects or harm of taking them. Oh, no, there isn't any yeah. harm. They taste delicious too. Like if yeah. I was to get, so, if someone <laughs> gave me a bottle full of the watermelon flavor, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these CAAs, then yeah. Yeah, I'm ha yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll use that. But for because sure. we're not sponsored and we have to pay for things on our own back, it's a no from us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's, I think it's a, a worthwhile point to note because I think, like we said, a lot of times you see particular supplements promoted by influencers and fitness people that are sponsored and therefore they are getting it for free and they come on saying, oh, I've got so much more energy and this mm. and that and I recover quicker. And you think, oh my God. I should be taking that. I want to be able to recover quicker and I want more energy and oh, do I need to be taking this supplement in order to, to achieve those results as well? But so often when it comes with a $80 or $100 price tag, it's like, no, you can be doing other things that don't cost you that much mm. and still be getting the same results. So yeah. yeah, if you want to, if, if your goal is to attenuate or combat fatigue during prolonged exercise, use caffeine. Mm. That would be an effective way and a much cheaper way of doing it. I could see why this is attractive though, because it doesn't have that stimulant effect. Yeah. So, so the idea of it helping Mm -hmm. with that and not having that kind of you know you could take it in the afternoon for example if it worked <laughs> yeah. if you're doing a prolonged exercise session then and it wouldn't affect your sleep so I can yeah. see why it, it was an attractive candidate in that sense and then like you said in regards to muscle growth you're probably better off just with a protein supplement mm. or protein source that would probably give you more bang for your buck yeah so one of the things that I always find a little bit frustrating about protein powders is that they always taste like dessert and I often don't feel like drinking dessert mm. and so that's where like BCAAs as a way of increasing your protein intake a little bit sure and could have been an attractive thing because they taste more like a cool drink of yeah like fruity fruit juice, <laughs> a juice yeah but now I think that there are products where it's a full protein powder and it's a more fruity drink which oh, okay. I'm very interested in yeah so yeah someone told me about those and I quite like to try them yeah so yeah I can absolutely see why people have gravitated towards this and why people use it and it isn't any harm yeah it's but, not any harm it tastes nice yeah but if you're having to pay for it yourself <laughs> and it might be breaking the budget then don't worry yeah if it's breaking your budget then yeah take that stress out of your life yeah, yeah. <laughs> and have some orange juice instead no. <laughs> So next up, collagen. Yes, collagen. One that I feel has just become more popular in these last few years. I think prior to that, I didn't hear much about collagen supplementation. And yet now it's, I feel it's almost as common as using a protein supplement, mm. particularly in the influencing world. So yeah, this will be a great one to discuss. What is collagen? Why would we maybe want to be supplementing it? And is it worthwhile to be supplementing it? Yeah. I also, whenever I think of collagen, I always think of bone broth as well. Yeah. I was also <laughs> had their moment. And, um, yeah. or they still do have yeah. their moment in, in the light don't they uh, yeah <laughs> yummy so, <laughs> like oh. I, I've got nothing against uh, making like a chicken stock or things like that in my kitchen but it's not sort of something that I'm I think needs to be sort of leaned on as mm. the core to you know your skin's vitality or yeah youthfulness or health in general <laughs> and generally i mean correct me if i'm wrong but something like collagen on my our body does make it itself mm. and i've always trusted that my body will do its thing and make what it needs to in the hopefully correct dosage that it needs yes. for now at least yeah Maybe it's something I need to worry about when I'm older, but yeah. Yeah, so just to clarify for people, we didn't actually end up saying what collagen was, but collagen is another protein yeah. and it's an important structure, particularly in our connective tissue. So uh, our skin, our tendons, our cartilage, bones. It's also quite important in repairing the lining of the gut as well. It makes up a huge amount of our skin. It's like 75%, so that's why it's quite an important 75% of the dry weight of the skin, which sounds disgusting mm. <laughs> when you when when you express something as a, a the yeah. idea of skin as a in dry, dry weight. weight yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
It's also an important part of the extracellular matrix. And the extracellular cellular matrix is the space between the cells, essentially. But that has a structure, and it's also a really important communicator essentially for signaling growth and repair as well and collagen makes up a lot of that too mm. so I think there was a, a stat that I read it makes up one third of the total protein in humans so it's it's really significant and a bit like the BCAA example that we spoke through before you can see why people then go oh it's really important for our body's structure our connective tissues surely if we're making it more available by supplementing with more of it then it will help. <laughs> mm. Yeah, more is better, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But one thing to, to know, like you said before, is that your body creates it from amino acids. So collagen is a protein. It's made up of the building blocks, hundreds of them. In the case of collagen, it's a very large protein. I think the only amino acid, one of the only ones it doesn't have is, is actually tryptophan, <laughs> mm -hmm. which we just talked about before. So our body is capable of making it and repairing collagen and maintaining the structures within our, our body that require collagen. Uh, one of the reasons though that people do become sort of more obsessed with it is over the time course of aging, our ability and rate of making collagen starts to slow down mm -hmm. essentially the structures themselves start to degrade a bit as well and so that's another reason why the thought of supplementing with it could potentially be helpful mm -hmm. which is that correct me if i'm wrong would that be the case for a lot of our proteins as we age yeah which is why they sometimes recommending like when you get to that particular age to be supplementing protein a bit more if you're someone that oh, yes. probably hasn't yeah i mean yeah. it's the same thing with the idea of sarcopenia mm, yeah so someone as you age and osteopenia and all the other yeah yeah uh, also too this kind of links back into the creatine episode as well where we were talking about the use of creatine and how it can help as you age mm. and sort of assisting that maintenance of your muscle mass mm. too so and, and in that case it would be helping with the essentially the quality of training when you're combining mm. it with exercise yeah yeah and so because exercise as well is a very powerful stimulus for yeah. muscle protein synthesis and yeah. so you know it promotes that pathway repair those proteins too and so if you you're making sure that your diet is adequately flush mm. <laughs> with protein yeah then you will you should have enough there to replenish it yeah but yeah as as we age things just become a bit slower yeah so i guess that could be one of the reasons that people would consider supplementing it what are some of the other reasons that people choose to supplement collagen or have heard reasons why they maybe should well i think the dominant reason that's put forward is is for mostly aesthetic purposes right so your skin here nails <laughs> yeah because collagen is such an important protein for our skin as our ability to produce it starts to degrade then you will notice things happening mm. <laughs> in your skin that aren't just necessarily due to collagen like a loss of, of mm. collagen production there will also be external factors that are, sun damage and yeah. stuff over the years yeah yeah smoking yeah. as well whereas on the on the flip side of that if you put on your SPF you exercise regularly you make sure you have water and don't drink or smoke to excess then mm. usually your skin will be in pretty good nick depending on how much your genetics allow because that mm. process of I mean it's continuous that process of collagen production starting to degrade as we age but it starts to set in around your 20s or 30s but you might not notice the effects of that until much later on yeah so that's one main reason why people gravitate towards it or are interested in it is because it, of the allure of it you know yeah. getting rid of wrinkles or <laughs> yeah or which in that case I mean in regards to then skin products because that's where I think like would an internal like a supplement be then having more effect versus an external mm. supplement quote unquote which would be using a skin product that like I guess has collagen in it to be rubbing on your face right yeah I haven't looked into know. skin products in general but I do have many questions that around this for myself so yeah but first we'll go we'll just go through the different sort of types of supplements that we've seen in the collagen market and yeah 
Yeah, and then I want to have a discussion around that. Okay, yeah. Those points. Sounds good. (laughs) So I think initially what we saw with collagen supplements was collagen just as the entire protein in the supplement. Mm -hmm. And what I saw at the time and in terms of the science of that was collagen as a protein is huge. When it gets into your gut, it's just broken down into its separate amino acid blocks transported across and then essentially your body then decides where that's going to go and what it's going to rebuild or repair or grow Mm -hmm. for example so in in the case of those supplements you you can't (laughs) it doesn't go through your gut lining into your blood and then be like oh i I remember i was collagen again and then Mm. go go back into collagen and and then you know it gets transported to your jowls or like yeah (laughs) that's what i'd always thought and i knew that it depended on what sort of format a particular supplement was taken in Mm because i I always thought well it's a protein it's going to be broken down into its individual amino acids anyway it's not like by consuming that collagen you're ingesting it as a full collagen molecule yeah so yeah that's why my suspicion was like hmm yeah and then i'm not sure whether it was science or collagen companies or a lovely collaboration between both that came up with this innovation where they did sort of take that on board and go oh yeah that that is correct it will just be broken down what we'll do is we'll break it up into smaller peptides so smaller so you've got your collagen protein and then they've broken it up into smaller blocks that actually do get absorbed like through the gut in their whole form okay and so then the idea of that being that once they're in there in that form they are more likely to be used for the repair or building of collagen Mm -hmm. either again you don't get to decide where it's going to go so if you (laughs) potentially have an injury or somewhere else or or, you know your connective tissue in your knee needs repairing your body will prioritize no go to my face (laughs) my face (laughs) my nails yeah and it it isn't to say it won't go there yeah but it, that may not your body be. will prioritize it itself based on what it feels it yes. where it needs to go yeah, yeah. Uh, and so th- those collagen supplements they do actually there was a meta-analysis that came out in 2021 looking specifically at skin and collagen supplements for using the collagen peptides which i think pretty much now all of the, your main players in terms of collagen supplements will have taken on that new formulation mm. but just double check yeah and And so it does seem to confer a benefit to things like skin elasticity, hydration, firmness, appearance. When taken in that form, in that meta-analysis, the dosages were quite a large range. So it was like two grams a day beyond 15, I think in some cases. I'd have to Mm -hmm. double check, but I can put that reference in the notes. But what sort of has become more accepted is the idea that you need to have a dosage of at least... 10 grams per day in order for it to confer those benefits on your skin. In addition, (laughs) you need to have the effects only noticeable just after 60 and then 90 days, somewhere in that range. So Mm -hmm. you need to be taking it for at least two months, perhaps three, before those differences will be noticeable. And they're only maintained after you stop it for 30 days. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So you're signing up for collagen for life. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> wait. Potentially. And I mean, collagen as well in the collagen peptide format it has been shown to be useful for conditions like osteoarthritis as well and improving joint health there's some evidence that it might be useful for people for athletes in reducing risks of joint damage things Mm -hmm. like that but I didn't go into looking into that in a huge amount of detail Mm -hmm. but what this bears the question for me looking at that so I just cannot for myself I can't justify buying collagen Mm. it's too expensive Mm. I I was doing some calculations before and it's about a dollar eighty to two dollars seventy per serving for 10 grand servings of your two main very large (laughs) well-known brands that that and taking that like you said daily for a minimum of three months yeah some sort of benefit and have to keep taking it to keep seeing those benefits yeah that's 
well over well over 200 bucks basically for that initial unless you get a sponsorship deal that <laughs> is for life <laughs> then you're all good but otherwise it's yeah it may, it may break the budget and did it in some of those studies did they have a control group whereby like they said obviously it did help with skin elasticity and mm. firmness etc was it able to sort of i guess say by how much like was it a noticeable increase yeah it was noticeable they had they also had measures where they did like visual it was a visual comparison oh, okay. yeah. so noticeable visibly yeah okay <laughs> so like wrinkles no wrinkles <laughs> You seem buy our supplement. <laughs> you seem very disappointed in this outcome, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and the so the thing with those studies and the reason why that meta analysis is quite good is because the literature in collagen it was really difficult to unpack it's all over the place in terms of dosages protocols there are some which have been clearly funded by companies that make a collagen supplement where they didn't bother to do a placebo etc yeah. and so that meta-analysis actually included it, it required that it was double blind mm -hmm. like placebo controlled design which is a, a big advantage when you're trying to assess a supplement yeah like this but one of the things so that's they compared everything to a placebo one of my questions is what about a comparison to just a protein supplement mm. because yes it does seem that there is an advantage of those collagen peptides but do they provide an advantage over and above providing adequate protein mm. and what was the baseline level of protein intake yeah for the well, population well those people may be under their protein requirements and this was helping them achieve their protein requirements yeah. or something yeah yeah so I've got lots of questions for myself around yeah. that side of it, which, so me looking at this and, and thinking, I just can't justify buying a collagen supplement for myself because it's too expensive. I sort of think, well, maybe the, the step for me then is actually to look at my protein intake and see where that's falling because I mm -hmm. haven't checked in on that for myself in quite a while. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that would be probably quite a good place to start for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, if you are buying collagen and then it will add to your overall protein intake yeah but it's an expensive way to do that yes yeah and so <laughs> if, if you if you can afford it then yeah that could be a good alternative and then like like we'd touched on before like you said a, a study comparing ingesting collagen in a supplement form versus collagen in a cream form in, in regards to skin mm. differences like seeing if that would have the same effect or a different effect because i just know with different skin products i've had before and when it was had had a doctor say it was a hormonal thing and even the dermal therapist i was seeing and said like yes this is a hormonal thing so she said this cream can only do so much because at the end of the day it's your hormones that are causing this skin issue and at least she was upfront about it it wasn't like this cream's gonna cure you and yeah. like fix everything because she was like well it might help but it's not the cure because I'm not treating the 100% cause, I'm treating the symptoms right now. Mm. So that's what I think with a collagen cream, like would that be having the same effect from the outside versus inside? From the inside. I don't know. Yeah, I also wondered based on the idea of, you know, your body prioritizing where collagen is made based on what needs repairing. I would love to talk to a dermatologist or someone who knows about this who, so if you do a, a skin treatment like microneedling mm. or, well, there's, a a topical treatment like retinols are also mm. known to help because they boost collagen production then how does that interact with potentially taking higher levels of protein if you weren't taking enough protein before or taking a collagen supplement mm. because does that then sort of act as a stimulus as what needs repairing and so it goes there true <laughs> yeah with the laser with the needling because that is technically it's like creating a trauma to the skin to help it reheal and therefore yeah reheal better yeah mm. or would that process this happen anyway if you didn't take the collagen if you were would it happen to the same sort of effectiveness anyway if you mm. weren't taking the collagen supplement because your body has just prioritized it at the expense of something else mm. that maybe needed repairing i'm not sure yeah lots of questions <laughs> yeah <laughs> um if anyone's doing research into collagen hit us yeah. up We've or if, <laughs> if there are any dermatologists then <laughs> yeah that might already know some of this stuff yeah it's interesting and like you said it's, it's probably again there's not a huge amount of good quality research that has a clear consensus on its benefit to probably outweigh the costs I guess yeah not enough for me personally at the moment to decide to 
supplement with it. Mm. On the show, I've spoken before about things like the different contexts to use creatine and or caffeine. And I feel mm. very confident about using mm. those in the context that I spoke about using them in to the point where I also, like after assessing all of this, go, yes, I, I use those. Mm. With both of these, I mean, BCAAs was very easy. With collagen, I'm open to seeing how this develops and where mm. it goes. But at the moment, for me, the cost benefit of it is not mm. high enough. I would rather put my money into buying a really good SPF. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, all those other things that, that look after our skin and keep our body in good shape, which is just exercising well, eating well, sleeping well. Yeah. All those sort of little things that I think do add up over the years. Yeah. Another thing with collagen too is vitamin C is really important for collagen production. Mm -hmm. So some of these studies you'll see vitamin C co-ingested with collagen because of that very reason. Mm -hmm. And so if a diet potentially is deficient in vitamin C and I don't know if going by the RDI necessarily in that case because vitamin C can be affected by stress and things as well mm. so if you've gone through a really stressful time mm -hmm. <laughs> been under a lot of stress then maybe your body isn't in, in more need of vitamin C mm. in those cases it will fluctuate yeah. not just yeah. stay at like the recommended daily intake but if you look at your diet and you can see oh I've started exercising a lot more and I'm maybe not meeting my protein needs anymore I haven't been eating a lot of vitamin rich foods mm. then perhaps having a look at those things yeah and that's probably one of the beneficial. only times I would recommend using some sort of calorie tracking app is yeah. more to just look at your macros and micro intake especially if you like you said you might be going through a period where you think oh I actually haven't sort of given much attention to what I've been consuming lately it can be good to just sort of track for a week not really looking at calories but more just like what is my protein intake and what is my mm. micro nutrients as well and go from there because like you said you could be low in something and just prioritizing those basic things which are generally a lot cheaper mm. and going from there first yeah but yeah, yeah I think that wraps us up unless unless you're sponsored by it and you get these things for free <laughs> um, probably don't worry about it and it's a good reminder to just always be a little bit skeptical of what you do see promoted online because again there may be some benefit but a lot of time it's probably not worth it if you're having to pay for that product yourself yeah absolutely and if you do happen to be taking either of these they're both very safe they're not going to cause any harm Mm -hmm. at all this conversation this discussion is around the science but also around some of those inputs that go into whether or not you if you're on the fence whether it's worth your money yeah, yeah. Awesome. If anyone's got any additional questions, where can they find you, Dr. Shah? Uh, I'm on Instagram at Charlie J. Connell. Yes, you are. And I'm on Instagram as well at Health Coach Shanae. Make sure you're following along at We Are Rise NZ as well and subscribe on YouTube at Rise Make Life Work Out. We'll see you next time. Yeah.